In 2006, Children of Men was released to critical praise, but a lackluster box office had it languishing as an overlooked masterpiece. It doesn't matter. Too late. It wasn't until a spike in nationalist politics and subsequent refugee crisis in 2016 that retrospectives hailed the film for its prescience. However, director Alfonso Cuaron rejects the notion that his film foresaw the future, simply because it's a depiction of how the world already was in 2006. These people were talking about that like two decades ago. There are no, no news, you know, no, to... No, it's not news. Children of Men is an adaptation of the 1992 novel by P.D. James, though Quarone never actually read it. He never what now? I never read P.D. James' book. Right. Uh, <laughs> okay, so how did Quarone adapt a book he never read into a cinematic sci-fi staple that's not about the future? It's time to ask, what's the difference? How, how did he do it? How did he do that? Why are women infertile? Why can't we make babies anymore? Fresh off the success of E2 Mama Tambien, Quaron was pitched a one-page summary of James's dystopian novel about a world stricken with infertility and a society without hope for the future. It was 2000, uh, year 2000, and I was very intrigued about the themes that were going to shape the new century. Yep. Immigration, yep. Uh, environment, populism, and authoritarian states. We tried to create an adventure that goes through the state of things, through the situation that humanity is living today. Quaron's adaptation is driven by a laser-focused mission, to paint a portrait of our post-9-11 modern world in crisis. He amplified the realities witnessed around the globe circa 2001 and condensed them into an hour and 49 minute tour of what apathy and hopelessness has wrought. Because Quaron recontextualizes the book's premise to fit the story he wanted to tell, many of the book's themes were lost in the adaptation, such as the scrutinization of power dynamics between genders. P.D. James asks what happens when a man's personal ambition puts him in a position of complete authority, and how much weight does a woman's single act of defiance carry? The story of this adaptation, however, is in the big swings Quaron took to create a 21st century vision of James's dystopian drama, which brings us to the first difference, the dystopian world itself. P.D. James' speculative future is set in 2021. England is ruled by a new political power, the Council of Five, including the main antagonist, a populist dictator known as the Warden, who promises his people comfort, security, and pleasures. The pacified society slips into malaise, however, as they await extinction. Over the course of the book, cracks in the peaceful facade reveal human rights abuses, and a state-sponsored culling of the elderly called The Quietus, which is modernized in the film as a state-branded suicide pill. The film is set in 2027 and does away with the dictator in entirely, instead opting for an all-too-familiar democracy where politics are driven by nationalism and xenophobia. Where the novel depicts a peaceful facade, Quaron turns England into a country dangling on the edge of chaos. The tone is set in the first scene when a bomb turns a mundane coffee run into abject horror, mirroring the real-life events of the 2005 London bombings, which occurred weeks before filming. It's a visceral introduction to a disturbingly familiar dystopia. The novel, however, takes its time describing the state of society through expository prose, covering all the various ways people found to cope, including obsessive doting on their pets. <coughs> The film bypasses much of the novel's exposition by inserting such details into the background. Through the use of wide shots and famously long takes, Quaron treats the environment with the same level of importance as the character. Because the script was kind of obscure in many ways, character-wise and stuff. I was more intrigued in the background, in the in the context, in this in in, what, in the society around. World went to sh Both mediums feature the same protagonist, Theo, a man without hope in a world without a future. Movie Theo is a drunk who has rejected his past as an activist in favor of the numbness of a government desk jockey. I don't talk politics. It's all you ever used to do. That was 20 years ago. Book Theo is a professor of history at Oxford. Rather than rejecting his past like his movie counterpart, he retreats into it. His nostalgic musings reveal himself to be a cousin and once confidant of the warden himself. Theo's numb existence is interrupted by the same incident in both mediums. He's approached by a group of insurgents who ask for a favor. In the film, Theo is kidnapped off the street in a heart-pounding sequence that fits right into the action thriller genre. The book, however, is decidedly not an action thriller. Instead, Theo is casually approached by an old student, Julian. Together with her hot-headed husband Rory, a Catholic priest, a midwife, and a long-distance driver, they make up the aforementioned insurgent group, the Five Fishes. Literally, there are just five of them. And in their naivete, they ask Theo to present their demands to his cousin, the dictator, on their behalf. 
There are far more than five fishes in the film, which expands the group into a large-scale operation that seeks equal rights for immigrants. The character of Julian changes from Theo's student to his ex-wife, book Julian's husband Rory becomes an unmarried militant revolutionary, and the book's midwife and priest are combined to create Miriam, a midwife with varied spiritual beliefs. I need your help. I need transit papers. Not for me. A girl. She's a Fuji. The fishes in the film also ask Theo to speak to his cousin, who in the film is a privileged government official who salvages great works of art. Couldn't save La Pieta. Theo is to use his cousin's status to procure transit papers for a character unique to the film, a refugee named Key. Which brings us to the crux of the story, the pregnancy. Jesus Christ. Key! The film's central conflict is framed through the lens of immigration, which, in this dystopia, has been made illegal. After escaping the worst atrocities, our government hunts them down like cockroaches. In a world where all women are barren, Key's pregnancy makes her a target for forced experimentation by a xenophobic society that does not value her humanity. We all know this government would never acknowledge the first human birth in 18 years from a Fuji. A wanted Fuji. The novel, however, does not contain any migrant characters. It is Julianne herself that is pregnant. And because it's the men in the book, not the women, who are infertile, Julianne believes that if the warden ever discovered her baby, he may claim to be the father, bolstering his status to godlike proportions. The novel and film feature two wildly different conflicts with equally divergent destinations. Book Julian simply wants to give birth on her own terms. Key, however, must escape persecution. By way of a thrilling ticking clock rendezvous with the vaguely named research group The Human Project, a plot device not at all present in the novel. I never read P.D. James' book, right? Theo goes on the run with the fishes in both mediums. Book Theo, already aware of the pregnancy, joins the fishes out of a sense of duty to Julian. The movie, however, forces Theo to join simply because his name is on the transit papers, making him more of a reluctant hero than his book counterpart. Once in the car, the beats of the film's second act are surprisingly similar to the novel. The first obstacle is marked by loss. In the book, the priest is murdered by a group of youths in a ritualistic human sacrifice, which the film translates into an ambush reminiscent of guerrilla warfare and a gut-riching scene where Julian is unceremoniously shot and killed. The innovative camera work instills a sense of realism that reflects the volatility present in many parts of the world today. The next obstacle is defined by betrayal. In the book, Julian's husband betrays the group to the warden in a last-minute power play after learning his wife's affair with the recently slain priest and true father of the child. Tomorrow, we'll do him then, after we move the gun. Rory also portrays the group in the film, but with the edge of a political thriller, as it's revealed that Julian's death was an assassination, effectively raising the stakes by adding the militant group as a second set of antagonists. With the world closing in on them, our group seeks sanctuary in the rural dwelling of Theo's friend Jasper, who is also adapted through the lens of immigration in the modern era. In the film, Jasper is an ex-political cartoonist whose wife was a journalist covering the migrant crisis until she suffered psychological damage at the hands of the government. Book Jasper is Theo's crotchety old mentor from university, whose wife suffers from dementia. But by the time Theo and the gang arrive, both Jasper and his wife are already dead, one at the hands of the state quietist, the other by his own hand. Oh, f oh f you. Michael Caine's charismatic portrayal of the character, however, does not give up hope. He sacrifices himself in a noble act of defiance against Rory and the fishes. Jasper's house is the last real parallel between the book and the film. As the story barrels towards its third act, the adaptation heads into completely original territory. In the book, the group hides out on the grounds of the University of Oxford, where Miriam delivers the baby with a few supplies they could scavenge along the way. The film instead has them sneak into a refugee camp en route to their human project meetup, where we experience police corruption and images of genocide. Unlike the novel, Miriam doesn't deliver the child in the film. Quaron again explores the relationship between foreground and background as a means to remove Miriam from the narrative. She causes a scene to distract from Key's labor and is moved from the film's foreground and pulled into the background to disappear under a black hood. Her existence is erased in an instant. Keep in mind, this is a democratic society. It's not like the book's Aurelian dictator, who has Miriam killed personally in an attempt to force the mother into state medical facilities, unaware the child had already been delivered in the nearby garden shed. Meanwhile, the child in the film is born inside the refugee camp, when the fishes stage their revolution and put our characters in the middle of urban warfare, evoking images of the Syrian civil war as well as the global war on terror. 
Needless to say, this is a massive scaling up of the novel's third act climax, which sees a standoff between just two men, Theo and his cousin the Warden, who is killed with a single shot in a scene that is somewhat reflected in the film's final conflict with Rory. We need the baby! We need him! Conversely, Rory wounds Theo with a single shot, but is then killed in an explosion in yet another unceremonious death in an unfeeling world. Which brings us to the conclusion. In both mediums, the ending centers around hope, but of course, the film has a wildly different approach. The book ends with Theo seemingly in a position to rule the country, but not without some hesitation. As a history professor, he's well aware of the effects of power on ambitious men. With this ending, James conveys the importance of historical knowledge in avoiding the pitfalls of our past. The film's ending is even more ambiguous. Having made it to the end of his mission, Theo succumbs to his gunshot wound just before the human project arrives for Key and her child. Quaron leaves it up to the viewer to interpret whether hope is alive. Is the human project going to help? Later on, uh, at their homes, is for audiences to ponder what to do with that hope. If you're a pessimist, the human project will be just as self-serving as Rory. To optimists, Quaron's choice to fade the film out to the sound of children's laughter represents the dawn of a new era under the human project. It's an idea born out of the new generation. It's something new, something better than the old paradigms more effective than the flower power of the 60s, less destructive than militant revolution, and certainly more empathetic than politics. But the idea is out there, waiting to be plucked by younger, diverse minds. There's the book that is absolutely brilliant, is really good, but has nothing to do with what we're doing. The film posits that if we can find the courage to reject fear and embrace hope, perhaps we can pave the way for the future generations. And if we're anything like Theo, we might not get to see what the future looks like. Maybe the best and most important thing we can do is just help it get to the boat. That's it for this episode, but let us know what you think of Children of Men in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more What's the Difference.